Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good to be here. Thank you very much. So, uh, my name is Charlie DeCourcy. So, uh, I hail from Rackspace. I've been at Rackspace about five and a half years. Uh, I joined as a, a Linux admin uh, back when Linux administrators were still called Linux administrators and not DevOps engineers. Um, but that's kind of my journey through. Before that, I was at Sun Microsystems for about five and a half years, kind of knocking around in professional services. Um, so what I do now is I, I lead one half of our DevOps automation service. So we are helping customers go on the journey towards being fully DevOpsified. Um, so what that means is that we, uh, we automate all their infrastructure um, and they just manage their code. So this is, this is a, a visionary statement and this is what we're aiming for. Um, we're a startup within Rackspace essentially and we're, we're making all this work. Um, um, it's complex. It, uh, config management can be quite easy, still a layer of complexity, but when you have a very defined uh, environment to work in and you know all the variables, uh, you can get things done. But what we're trying to do is do it for a multi-tenant approach. So how do we do DevOps and config management for 100 if not 1,000 customers? So we're kind of building a tool set um, using Chef um, to kind of address this. So has anyone here used ChatOps, Slack? Hip chat, a few slack, cool. So I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but so we've started using chat ops for all of our customers that get onboarded during the, for the DevOps automation service. So this is IRC on steroids, essentially. It's a chat app like any other chat app. Uh, the beauty of it is that it's completely API driven and it has a whole load of plugins that can interact with different APIs. So it means that it can interact with Jenkins, Google Drive, Dropbox, um, GitHub, um, but what it really means then is that you can have people centered in a channel and it could be around an application, it could be around um, a specific environment or a customer. And everybody that's involved in that application is then in that chat room. So what it means is when a developer goes and puts his pull request in GitHub, then it updates the channel and people can talk about it, approve it. Um, as it goes through, Jenkins might pick it up, run some jobs to test it. The output of that then gets put into the channel as well. Um, and through into uh, Chef and into your deployment, um, and even our monitoring might update the channel as well. So what that means is that you get a very open approach to managing your application. Gone are the days where it's people working in their little black boxes and you hope that some change somewhere isn't going to impact you. The idea is that everything is just there in one page, so you get a stream of consciousness for the application. So, we didn't want to do a, a salesy type uh, presentation here, so the well, best way to do that by talking about something that we don't actually do. Um, this is a, a, a demo that we run. It was a proof of concept. Um, we have all these customers, and some of them will be incredibly technical, some of them will be not that technical. But we need to approach them and help them use DevOps and help them use config management all the way up to CI, CD. Um, and they don't always understand the deepest, darkest internals of Chef. So what we're trying to do is abstract that away. So the idea of this a proof of concept is how easy can we make it for a customer to deploy an application into a staging environment, deploy another, uh, upgrade it to a, a production environment, and then use blue-green deployment to move the traffic between the two. So that's essentially what we're trying to address. So it's kind of got three components. So one is this uh, beefy Ruby, Ruby script that uh, Nate's here. we crafted a lot of it. Hand up, Nate. Yeah, see? It's like the embarrassing dad, isn't it? Um, so there's a whole for, uh, few DevOps uh, uh, guys from Rackspace here as well on the front row. So if any, any of you want to come and talk about anything you see here, uh, these are definitely the guys. They're far smarter than me. So anyway, we've got this uh, Ruby uh, script that sits in Slack. Uh, we're using New Relic uh, heavily for our monitoring. Uh, we give it away to our customers when they take anything on the cloud. Um, and we're using a whole suite of Rackspace cloud products, so load balancers, DBAS, um, cloud servers, autoscale groups. Um, we host the, the largest OpenStack public cloud uh, in the world, uh, and this is what it's using in the back end. So a lot of it, if anyone's familiar with OpenStack, hands maybe. Okay, wow, that's good. That makes me feel a warm and fuzzy inside. So um, basically it's all driven by heat. So we can have a very uh, complex set of templates that this bot is driving to enable us to create environments. So this is the customer application. It's Drupal 7, doesn't look like Drupal 7, it's sat in GitHub. Um, but essentially this is the customer's application and this is where they're gonna manage and maintain their code. Um, so this is a Slack window. I'll paint a picture for those at the back. Uh, essentially, you've got your chat window here, you've got your channels, and down at the bottom, someone started typing forward slash RAX. And what that does is bring up a whole subset of commands that the guys have coded in. 
So you can deploy infrastructure, change DNS, uh, you can read some information and get the hooks. Um, there, there's a whole load of uh, information that you can pull out of. So the idea is that you keep people centered in the channel. Actions happen in the channel, information is, re is received in the channel, so everybody can see it and be party to it as well. So in this instance, we're going to use Racks Deploy. So we're going to say we want to create a staging environment. Um, we're going to give it the database, uh, and off it goes. We fire it off in the script. The infrastructure starts building. Um, we can see it time. And as we move into the Racks Based Control Panel, we can see what's happening behind the scenes. So this is one of the stacks. Uh, we can see the staging environment's just been created. Um, and here are the details. So these have all been defined by the heat template. Um, so in this instance, we're going to say that we want a load balancer, a database that's going to be created, and it's going to pull in a flat file. Uh, we're going to use this as we move into production as well. Uh, that it's going to create an autoscale group, and finally it's going to make a DNS change. Now, this is entirely configurable. We can change it. And in fact, you'll see another one later where we, we do something slightly different with it. Um, so here we go into the load balancer. We can see it's being configured. We're doing HTTPS offloading to reduce the load in the servers. Um, it also means that we can drop nodes in and out. Um, we're setting a, a database instance. Again, it's pulling that flat file in. Um, everything gets configured on our behalf. And at this point, you can see this stream of text that kind of goes across the page, and you're probably going, someone shoot the AI guy, that's uh, the UI guy, sorry, that's uh, made the uh, interface for Rackspace Portal. But it's, we've configured that with a heat template. We've said it will actually be useful for someone coming into this later to be able to pull the API um, yeah, hook. Um, so that they can access it later. So we put it up there as well. Um, and here is where the scaling group. So we basically say we want a minimum of two servers, a maximum of 10. And we're going to say what happens when we hit different webhooks, so whether we add or remove a server. Um, and we can see these two servers have been created down at the bottom, a little bit of green. Um, so then we go back into our chat window. And the idea is that we've never had to leave our chat window, right? It's all there. It's told us how long it's taken. So in four minutes, 30 seconds, it's created our infrastructure for us and popped out the low balance IP address. So this is where Chef kicks in, right? So it is going to start configuring these nodes for us. So uh, let's say this is Drupal. It's got no, um, no caching or anything. So it's just Apache, PHP, FBM. And it's going to connect to our DBAS instance in the back. So off it goes and configures the nodes. Um, we can see in the load balancer that they come online and everything's ready to go. So we can literally go to our browser and pop it in and off it is. So it's made the DNS change for us so the site is live. So just to put that in perspective, that was one command that one user ran in a chat program. Um, you know, it's easy to do this from anywhere. And we've got people, it could be customers, it could be rackers controlling this as well. Um, so they're all pre-configured to speak to New Relic as well in this instance. Uh, so they're going to start chucking uh, monitoring information into the staging application. And we can see that the data starts to flow in. So we're getting like an 80 millisecond response time. Uh, it's pretty good for um, you know, an uncached application. There's nothing in front of it at all. Um, so we can see the, the data start to stream in. Um, and we've got app decks in the top corner. Do people use app decks? little bit. So AppDex basically says uh, it's the measuring the user experience of that page or that application. So you're counting the amount of times that it's either successful and people are happy or they're a bit frustrated or things are a bit slow. And it basically does a calculation to get a real uh, user experience at the back of it. And we're going to be using this to drive some of our activity. So the idea is that if something slows down in the application, it's going to be reflected in that. So all the nodes have been configured, and obviously, because everything is up and working and wonderful, we're going to do what all good techs do and probably play with it a little bit. So we, our developers have been working on version 2 of the application, uh, introduce some new features. So we're going to use a, a revision command. We're just going to say, Racks revision, uh, I want you to use version 2 of the code. It's just a tag in GitHub, essentially. So it's going to search for that, it's going to look for that, and it's going to start building our environment. Um, in this instance, it's just going to go straight over the top of the existing nodes. We're staging, it doesn't matter. Uh, we just want to try out the latest application. So off it goes, Chef configures it, um, and again, it starts putting uh, monitoring information back in. So in New Relic, you get a little line uh, when the application's been deployed. I'm sure many other monitoring platforms all do the same. Um, so essentially, it allows us to troubleshoot really easily after we've made a deployment. Um, so we can see the the release has happened as well. We can look at the history of all the releases and the, and the app deck score and how anything might have been negatively affected by that release. Um, so we can see this huge spike. I mean, this is our existing uh, traffic. So you can see something's probably gone a little bit wrong. Uh, it's gone up to about three and a half seconds. 
Um, and we can also see uh, from the yellow box that this is MySQL, so we, we know immediately where we have to go looking. Um, and in fact, we can start clicking through, we can um, go into the transaction trace, uh, and we can even look at the SQL statement. Um, because it's running on the server, it's chucking all this information out to New Relic. So we have some really uh, deep and rich uh, monitoring information come back. So uh, the nice developers put a select sleep statement in, uh, which isn't going to help anybody in any way, shape or form. So we probably want to roll back to our previous version of the application. Um, so we're going to use racks revision. Uh, this time we're going to use a force flag. It basically says just SSH of the boxes and please save me now. Uh, it doesn't wait for the next chef run, so it's going to chuck it straight over the top again. So off it goes, it starts configuring it, and Chef again has re remade these nodes into version one. So we're back into a very good state. And again, we're just using a few commands in a window. So here we can see that the, the spike is finished, everything is back to normal, the sysadmin can go back to sleep, um, everything is right as rain. Um, and we can see there's this red flag uh, period here, which essentially says we crossed an, crossed an alert threshold. Um, so what we're going to do is configure that to say, um, what do we do when that alert happens? Um, we're using an alert policies uh, section in New Relic, and we can basically say, when the app dex, which is our user experience, drops below 0.7, um, higher is good, lower is bad, and it only goes up to one. Um, so we're basically saying, when this has been impacted, uh, we're going to update Slack, and we're going to tell everybody, and then we're going to hit the auto scale hook um, to have an event happen out the back of it. So everything is configured. Um, and we're going to do some testing. So the guys have built in a rudimentary load tester. Uh, it's just using Siege on Linux. Again, we're removing the need for, for the user to actually understand anything, to log into a box. Like Everything can just be done here. And it could be as complex or, or easy as, as you want to make it. So in this instance, to say we're hitting Siege, in another instance, you could spin up 100 servers, fire load to it, um, compile all the results, and put them back into a window. I and mean, there really is no limit as to what you can do and how powerful it can be. So we're going to hit it with 200 connections for 600 seconds. Um, and off it goes. Um, we can see the load start coming in. It's a little bit healthier than last time. At least it's not this crazy massive spike in MySQL. So everything's probably in a good shape. But we can see the AppDex score actually starts dropping. So there has been a real user impact on this. Um, so we understand that we want to take some kind of corrective action. It's all completely automated. So we can see the alert starts to come in. Uh, and that webhook or set of webhooks will have now fired. So the chat window has been updated. We've got one at the bottom that says, hey, you've got an alert in uh, New Relic and you should go check it out. So anyone that's in the channel knows now that there's a problem. But the line above it says that we've added one web server. So it's spun it up. It's going to configure it with Chef. And as soon as that's ready, it's going to be chucked into the load balancer pool and ready to receive traffic along with the other nodes. So it's some rudimentary auto healing. Now, I'm sure anyone that's into Docker and containerization will tell me there's some shortcomings in this. You know, we still have to spin up the infrastructure. It still has to be a server that starts. Um, we're kind of experimenting and looking at Docker at the moment to try and look at how we can reduce that so you can get um, more nodes up in seconds is the idea instead of having to wait a, a few minutes for Chef to run. Um, so here we can see our, our, our traffic spike has ended. It's got better. And the, and the alert window closes. And again, it's updated the channel. It said to us, hey, it's done. And it's triggered the downscale event as well, because everything is now all gravy. So it's going to get rid of that node. And that's essentially all we wanted to know. We wanted to see, if we chuck load at this thing, and we chuck it above an expected user traffic level, is it going to respond in a way that we want? So we've proved it. We're happy. Um, it'll do for now. I mean, obviously, some performance tuning we probably wouldn't go amiss. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to use uh, blue-green deployments to pop it in. Who uses blue-green deployments to do stuff? Cool. It sounds really fancy, and it's added some colors to it. It really is not. It's very, very simple. Um, so the, the basic is that we have either a load balancer, so we're using cloud load balancers. You can do this with DNS as well if you have the TTL set low enough. Um, but what you have is your production environment. So this is our environment that already stands. Um, in this case, it's the staging, um, but we have everything out there and already accepting traffic. This is a live site as far as anyone con is concerned. Now, what we do is we spin up another environment alongside it. So this is configured. It could have new patches applied. In this case, it's going to have our latest version of the application. So we can do some UAT testing on it. Uh, we could make sure that it's all working as expected. Um, in this case, we know that it's all up and running. We know that we we're ready to accept traffic. 
So what you do is you make the change at the load balancer or the DNS and you start move, using the, the move, moving the user traffic over to it. Um, now if you look at people like Spotify for example, the, the UI of their page is broken into like a hundred different streams and it, different teams will be responsible for different segments. Now they do th this in a way where they will release a small part of their application to a small user set using exactly the same principles. So they will put some, load but some into the pool, some users will get it and they can then measure what the output is before they switch everything across to it. So we are now ready to deploy our production environment. Ta-da! We've gone on a journey, hasn't it been fun? Anyway, um, so here we're going to use the Racks Deploy again. Uh, we're going to create a production environment, uh, and we're using a different flag. We're saying basically this is, this is going to be our production environment. We don't want you to create a database. We don't want you to change the DNS, because that would actually be impactful. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to deploy our code to production. Now, what I haven't mentioned about blue-green deployments as well is why we would use it is because your traditional way of upgrading nodes and, and upgrading your traditional servers, it's, it can be slow, you can still execute it, you might need a maintenance window, you could remove servers from the pool and then upgrade them, but the idea is that that is a destructive action. There is no going back easily from that. If this doesn't work out, in theory we can just revert the traffic back to, straight back to the other nodes as well. So it's got some advantages. Downsides is it's expensive. In theory, you have to spin up two sets of uh, infrastructure, but in a, in a cloudy world, in theory, we can have a, a very little crossover between the two, and it gives us a whole lot of uh, stability and benefit out the back. So here's our um, production. It's going to go off and build again. We can go into the control panel, and we can see the, the production environment. So this time, we're just building a load balancer, and we're building an autoscale group. So off it goes, starts configuring, comes back in a, a minute 58, uh, and then Chef kicks off as well. So Chef's going to start configuring those nodes in exactly the same way as it did before. It's so easy then for me to get this site live that I can do it from my mobile phone whilst getting coffee and chatting to someone else. Just by using the racks DNS command to change it to the new load balancer IP. And you could even just put slash racks live and it would, it would put your production environment live. So we've just put this in the hands of a user who does not have to understand Chef, he does not have to understand any of the monitoring environment, how anything is configured. And we've put the power in their hands to release an entire new application into their environment and move all their traffic over to it. And the site is live. So thank you very much. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, wasn't it? Thank you.